Welcome to Corralling the Chaos podcast, where we talk publicly about the things you're worried about privately. My name is Angela Lea, and I'm your host. This is the event industry podcast for companies and crew, where we're going to dive deep into things like, what does our industry need that it just doesn't have? What are the things you want to know, but you're just too afraid to ask? And what are the biggest opportunities ahead for our industry? We're going to go deep and nothing is off limits. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Corralling the Chaos. Today, I want to dig into a really relevant topic that all of us are probably dealing with in some form or fashion, and that is the relationship between the event companies and the suppliers that they rely on. And today, we have two great people to help us unpack this. First, we have Susan Connor, who spent the last several years as a labor coordinator at Fuse Technical Group, which is a technical partner for live event production shows. Prior to Fuse, Susan spent nine years doing the same thing at VER, which is now PRG. She very quickly learned the life of a crew because she was married to a freelance tech for 11 years, which has helped her in her current position really understand that perspective. It's no surprise that she loves puzzles and mysteries, as that's exactly what she does every day, making sure the right people with the right skills show up for her shows day in and day out. We also have with us Aaron Merkin, founding partner and director of operations for Groundwork Operations up in New York City, who specializes in event operations by providing on-site production crews. Certainly a need for that. With 20 years of experience in event production, Aaron has a big picture vision and an eye for detail. He is a multi-instrumentalist and visual artist who was born and raised in Manhattan's Upper West Side. He currently resides with his wife, Sharon, their son, Max, and their dog, Taco, love the name, in Fairmont, Philadelphia. Welcome to the show, Susan and Aaron. I am thrilled to have you both here today to really learn more about what you're seeing in crazy times. I don't think our industry has ever experienced some of the demand with the restraint, with the restraints that we're asked to deal with more than we have now. Um, but first things first, Aaron, what kind of dog is Taco? Um, he's a Shih Tzu with the heart of a pit bull. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, he's, we're huge, he's, he's, huge, he's the huge. mayor of the neighborhood. I love it. I love it. We have, um, we just put on our website at Lasso, our Lasso Pets, um, we are a huge uh, animal company, so I absolutely love that. Had to ask first, what kind of dog is Taco? Important um, information. So I wanted to address this topic today because it really speaks to really the importance of having solid relationships in the industry, especially because of the heavy reliance on each other that we really have now more than ever before. Um, and given that asked to put great crews together, it's often last minute. It really does require complete trust and cooperation between both the company and the labor agencies for both parties to pull off these epic shows under these circumstances that exist today. And I really want to talk about some of the conditions that we're seeing. And so here are a few observations I've had just within the last couple of weeks. I'm reading LinkedIn posts. I'm talking to customers. Um, People are reaching out to us asking what, what we're seeing. And these are just a few of the observations, so I would love to get your insight on these. I read a LinkedIn post that said they had a crew of 40 people scheduled, only half, 50% showed up. So that meant everyone worked through the night, everyone was exhausted, um, but only half showed up. Another one, they had a crew of eight, no one showed up. Imagine that. You're expecting eight people to help you set, and no one shows up. Another one had a crew of 12, none of which had ever even worked an event, never even set foot on an event site. That's a disaster waiting to happen. We also heard crew agreeing to work shows and then they cancel last minute because something better came up. Also had one where a company was sharing that uh, their customer sent over a request for 38 additional people the day before in a high demand, low supply market. Again, that talk about pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Hey, last minute, I need you to find me 38 more people. And these were skilled positions. And then the last one is crew not being treated well at show site due to the stress levels. 
So when I hear those things, I just think, gosh, what has happened to our industry? What in the world is going on? And so I guess I would love to hear from each of you what you're seeing from your vantage points. I can't believe how different it is right now. I used to send 10 emails and get the three guys that I needed. And now I'm sending 30 to 50 and maybe getting one or two people. Um, it's been extremely overwhelming because it seems like there are more shows at the same time Mm -hmm. and it's very difficult and I've never relied on, um, labor companies as much as I have recently. It's been a very, very big change for us. We've always handled it as in-house as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was always fun and pretty easy. We built a really amazing list of freelancers, just absolutely amazing. And we've lost a lot of them. A lot of them committed to things um, towards the um, beginning of this year that they've never done before because they didn't know what there was going to be. And that's, you know, messed up schedules for us. Um, But it's as much as it's changed, we still do everything all day, every day. We haven't failed. The show still goes on, right? Absolutely. Yeah. What about you, Aaron? What are you seeing? First, I'd like to say that none of none of those challenges that uh, you articulated with crews not showing up or half of them showing up, um, none of our clients will ever experience that um, working with, with Groundwork because uh, we take our role very seriously and we understand that, you know, setting up an event, is like a table. And if there's one of the legs isn't there, um, the thing can collapse. And so we are value our role enough to know that that is unacceptable. Um, I, I, we've seen the same thing of, you know, there's a, an abundance of work, the gap in work in our industry from the pandemic did lead people some, in some instances to other industries or into more individualized full-time roles that are not crew oriented. Um, and so, yeah, there's, you know, we are needed more than ever, which is, which is good for us. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the, w- the way that we approach things is we take accountability for our relationship with our crew and then our relationship with our client is a separate thing as well. So um, if I tell a crew member they're going to show up, you know, they're, they're going to get paid for something regardless of, of, you know, if a client is complaining or, or treating us a certain way or treating them a certain way on site. Um, we're not going to let that sway how we deal with our crew because our, our commitment to them um, is not dependent on the commitment that our clients made to us because, you know, they didn't, our crew didn't review the contract or meet our point of contact at, at, on the client side. So, and then vice versa, you know, if, if um, half of a crew cancels last minute, you know, that's, we can say, Hey, you know, these guys canceled last minute, but um, we're the ones who vetted that crew member. And so yeah. ultimately, you know, the, the way we, we started the business and um, sometimes you have to go into this, you know, survival mode now when you have those, I need 38 people tomorrow was, you know, call friends, call cousins, call friends and have them call friends and call cousins. And, you know, I, I've had personal conversations on cell phones with, with friends of friends of relatives that I never met before and had this person show up at two in the morning in Times Square to operate a camera or a forklift. Um, and all of that happened between the hours of, 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. because the need came in the next day, you know, and I I think um, trying to not personalize those things or be swayed by the emotions of the stress um, and just put one foot in front of the other. You know, there's a a, in in our crew training, we we differentiate between practical skills and emotional skills. And I think in this industry, um, the emotional skills take uh, have a higher Um, realm of importance than in most other occupations and other industries because it is such a roller coaster ride and can be so unpredictable. And so the the metaphor that we use is, you know, if if you've ever been stuck in traffic in in a car full of people, there's always one person who has road rage or can't deal with it is cursing, honking the horn. Um, And then there might be another person who's enjoying the music, looking out the window, 
um, having a good time. And both the people in that vehicle get to the same destination at the same time. Um, so it's in our power to choose our experience in, in the face of the stressors and, and triggers that we're um, being presented with. And so I think in this industry, more than any other, we have to try to stay poised and just you know, put one foot in front of the other. We're, we're all going to get to that destination. And, um, you know, as Susan said, everything, when everything goes well in the very end, people often don't then unpack what went wrong. So the same things can, <laughs> can go wrong because yeah. you say, oh, it all, it all worked out, you know? Um, so I think we all know what we signed up for. We know what we're likely going to face. And so the best thing you can do is try to stay on your square and, and, um, be ready for what comes. I have learned recently to not take rejection personally because people that I've worked with for 10, 12 years, when they tell me no, I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean you're working for someone else? So I've had to, to learn how to not take that personally and just be happy everyone's working. And I think, you know, being outcome oriented as well, because I think a lot of times, you know, emotions are very reactive and irrational. And that can be a client on site who at the beginning of a load in prioritizes signage and the, you know, we, we talk about um, bones, muscles, skin, where you might want to unload and set up the infrastructure of the layout. And then you want, and that's the, the bones, the skeleton, and then you add, you know, distribute product into the tents. And then lastly, you want to skin the event. But oftentimes you might have a client who then has their own end client and their biggest concern is the optics. And so they're digging through a signage palette and wanting to prioritize that, but you don't have barricades to put those signs up on yet. And that's an, uh, you know, it's an emotional reaction because they're, they're picturing their client walkthrough and they're not necessarily picturing the like A to Z outcome. And I think, you know, everybody just tuning back in, okay, you know, this, this person rejected me. This person is yelling at me. Um, ultimately, if you're a crew member on a job site, you want to, keep your job, you want to work, um, generate income to provide for your family. You want your client to look good so that they can have, you know, they, their client can continue to hire them and then they can continue to hire you. And um, those are the outcomes that we're looking for and being reactive or taking things personally um, while they feel like an appropriate response. Sometimes they don't generate the outcome that, that we're all looking for. I love all of that. You guys just unpacked so much. You talked about accountability, commitment, choosing your experience, being outcome focused. There's there's a lot of good nuggets um, in there that I hope all of us caught because I think there's a lot in there. So Susan, when you, I know it's new for you to now have to rely on suppliers. Um, I know that's very different than in the past for you, but what do you look for in a talent supplier? Like describe your ideal supplier. What does that engagement or relationship look like? Someone that we know, I mean, that's always, if it's, you're not going to find what you're looking for with a Google search, it's going to be a reference from someone else. That's always the first place we start. And then responsiveness and honesty. If you can do it, great. If you can't, let, let us know as quickly as possible so that we can move on and find someone who can. Um, and if someone's honest about those kind of things and responsive about what we're asking, it generally trickles down to how they're treating their people and how they treat their people is important to us because it brings that attitude that Aaron was talking about, you know, it brings that to us. So you want to find someone who's, um, who cares about the industry and understands it. Um, I think one of the most important things is asking questions. And I know with Lasso, you guys ask me questions. Um, you just have a few little questions that you always ask. And I hate how often I don't have those answers <laughs> and how much I have to track those answers down. Um, because I don't deal directly with the client. I'm dealing with my project manager or salesperson to get that information. And like Aaron was saying, sometimes they don't think about those bones, um, that it's really important. Yes, we have the person, we know the location and we know the time, but there are a lot of other little details that we need to get. And you guys asking those questions helps me 
prepare for the next thing. Um, it helps me know what thing to be aware of because prior to using um, uh, labor suppliers, I would just turn them over to the PM directly and they would always have, you know, we had a few different layers of management of an event that we don't really have right now. We usually have one person and generally we would have, you know, an AE on site as well as the project manager and then a crew chief. And we're lucky to have a lead yeah. <laughs> right now. Yeah. So, Times are different. Yeah. I'm, I'm, needing more input than I ever did before, because, you know, like I said, I'm usually, I'm a step closer now than I was before yeah. to, to dealing with things. And, you know, when things come in quickly, that's when we need the, the most information. And that's generally, <laughs> don't get it. But those are the kind of things, like if someone just says, yeah, sure, I can take care of that. I hesitate a little bit. If someone says, okay, give me all of the, this information and then I will let you know if we can handle it. That makes me feel a little more comfortable. Um, yeah, they're being more intentional with it. Yeah. It, it, it just shows a level of, of detail-oriented work that I wish we could still provide, but we're missing that person. And they're stepping into that role. A new person is stepping into that role with our within our experience. Yeah. And it takes a long time to trust someone, but those initial questions, the initial interest in what we're doing and things like that is something that makes a difference to me. Makes good sense. Erin, same question for you. What's your ideal customer that you and your team love to work with and what makes them ideal? I just want to jump in on something Susan said um, quickly about the honesty and the transparency, because that it's great to hear you echo something that we at Groundwork have spoken spoken about for years. And, you know, when we, when we first started the company, we were in our twenties. Um, and I think everybody in general deals with some degree of imposter syndrome. And then, you know, when you're dealing in, in the event world, with, which often is ex experiential marketing, there's, it is about the perception and the aesthetics. And so everybody wants to be able to say yes. And you're, you're, you're serving clients up the chain and, and you want to appeal to them. And when we, when we had that kind of young Im imposter syndrome, almost lack of entitlement um, about about our professionalism, we said yes to everything. And it took maturing as a business um, to recognize that saying no and being clear about your limitations actually speaks to your confidence in your capabilities. Because when you know where your capabilities end, you're really owning your capabilities. And when somebody says yes to everything, you start to question, you know, whether they really can handle all of that. You know, it's like go going to a restaurant that has too many things on the menu, as opposed to a restaurant that's very limited, and you know that they prepare those dishes um, excellently. And so it's great to hear you, Susan, from the, from the client side, echo that because that's a has, has had been an evolving conversation. And where we have landed in general is, um, you know, we lean towards transparency, whether we're having trouble staffing something or if um, we're going to send somebody who's greener, we want to be transparent about that and, and manage expectations so everybody can um, understand what they're working with. And then we know our, our limitations. You know, of course, in the beginning, we said yes to everything because and then hung up the phone, you know, had minor heart attacks and then called cousins and friends of friends and, and figured out, you know, what is what is a V3? You know, I, I came from the general, uh, very general crew world where we were, you know, truck driving. Um, I, I started the company from, from the back of a lift gate or, you know, on a forklift. Um, and then we transitioned to a more skilled stagehand area. So when we got our first order, you know, I had to call friends and even unpack what the terminology meant. Um, but now we really own what we can do and we own, um, the point at which what we can do ends. Um, I, I would say for us in terms of an ideal client, um, we have we have two kind of different client structures. We have one type of client that has a number of that that tend to serve um, a number of their own clients with a variety of services in experiential marketing or event production, and they often form um, an account team around each client. And sometimes they'll allocate a person on that team to to be the 
person in charge of crewing. And that might be a different person every time, even though you're dealing with the same client. And that lack of consistency can create a real learning curve on the client side. And then just in terms of the relationship and the dynamic between us as the vendor and them as the client, we often end up um, almost training and educating newer employees of our long-term clients about how things work, even saying, hey, um, this is where you have your truck rental accounts. You know, I would suggest starting here and doing this. Um, we find that clients that have a more centralized um, logistics operation team that we can have like one point of contact and they're handling the crewing and the operations and the logistics for all of the account teams on, on the various programs. That's very helpful. Um, client Clients who have a real understanding of logistics, um, not just their ability to sell and manage their own clients, but to understand the A to Z execution of how things happen. You know, it, it can be very easy to say, hey, I need a guy with a truck to make a bunch of pickups in Manhattan tomorrow. Um, but then the, the questions that seems very simple, but then if you've never gone through that experience yourself, where does the truck come from? Um, you know, are there ratchet straps and dollies and shrink wrap? So a client who understands that or who can be receptive to that feedback. And I think, you know, again, taking the emotions and the ego out of it and being able to recognize the value of ideas um, independent from their source, because oftentimes um, we have clients who may um, perceive us as like a labor vendor. And sometimes even the word labor can feel like dirty or, or diminutive. And, and we actually um, use, try to use the word crew as much as possible because um, so many of our crew members especially coming from an, an arts background, you know, they may be um, working in a blue collar industry. They may come from a, a lower income background, um, but they're brilliant and they have amazing strategic logistic minds. And just because they're on a forklift or on the back of the truck doesn't mean they may not have a, a better understanding of the way a task could get executed. And so I think Again, just dropping ego, dropping emotion and being receptive of ideas, regardless of the source and and willing to collaborate, because I think that collaboration um, going in both directions is is where we all end up with the outcome that we're going for, because we, we are all on the same team. And, and as you mentioned in the beginning, Angela, there can be a lot of kind of competition and like, you know, pissing contests, parting my, my language on job sites. And ultimately, I think that competition does come from the insecurity and the blame game comes from feeling the pressure of serving clients. And ultimately, um, we all share the same goal. So I, th I think collaborative clients um, are the best. Yeah, could, could not agree more. There, there are two things there I want to address. Um, first, you talked about um, the desire to get rid of the, rid of the word labor. Could not agree more. We we did a big blog post on it, um, and you you say crew, I, which I think is awesome. I think that's that's a great replacement. Uh, we say talent because you're mm. right. These are talented people who come up with their own ability to think strategically, to think logistically. They're everyone is tasked with being a problem solver. The second you get at show site, right? The second you show up, you're there to solve problems because that's all it is. It's one thing after another, right? One wrench is thrown in. And so I love that aspect of it. And I also think if we could get the rest of our industry thinking less labor, more talent and crew, I think it allows us to raise the level of the perception and the value of what you as companies are offering to the end client, you're not providing labor. You're providing talent to give them an epic show. That doesn't happen with just labor or hands, which I hate that word, despise that word. And, um, you know, if, if I'm receiving a proposal from a company that's pitching me and they're pitching me labor, I'm thinking commodity. If you're pitching talent or crew, has a different connotation, right? Like I expect to may pay more for talent or crew than I would labor. And I think we're doing ourselves an injustice by how we talk about things, um, even with how we sell shows. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about. The other is you talked about, you know, giving the example of, of the truck in Manhattan. Well, the devil's in the details. And having people who are communicating with the client and helping the client think through those expectations, right? Is the client asking for something that Anything's possible, right? Just depends if you have the budget and time to do it. 
And I think so many times our industry is so used to get the deal, get the deal, get the deal that they lose sight of selling the show the right way. And I think there's something to that when it comes to selling the show. And, you know, what I mean by that is, are you asking me to do a show in Timbuktu where there is no talent? There's not, you know, a, a plethora of talent there. So we're going to need a travel budget included. And a lot of companies are afraid to, to pitch that because it makes their price higher. Are you selling it at the right margin? Um, are you getting enough notice? Are you managing the client to say, hey, if we're going to pull off this amazing show that we are going to give you a great outcome for, you too have a part you play in that. And one thing is you need to give us enough notice. You need to give us the green light and enough time because now we have to go plan logistically. We have to get with our suppliers to, to plan logistically. And then I also think about when it comes to selling the show it, is it organized appropriately? Is communication from the end client fragmented? It, are, are we as companies doing enough to lead our clients to set our companies up to have a successful show with minimal stress because we've done all the right things along the way? And I just feel like that tipping point, the spear of it, is how that show is sold and asking the right questions because that's a great point, Erin. The devil is in the details and saying yes to some deliveries is great on surface until you dig into the details and really understand what exactly that is. And that's where things can kind of go awry. So I think each of you make such great points with that. So thank you for that. Um, curious, are either of you seeing any patterns or trends, good or bad, that are emerging? Last minute's fun. <laughs> so you said last minute. So curious, Susan, what, what's the average lead time you are getting? And then Aaron, I'm going to come to you because you sometimes are maybe one step removed and sometimes not. But what kind of lead time are you getting, Susan? I handle a lot of different areas. Um, corporate shows tend to have way more lead time, um, but they also want names quickly so that they can do hotel blocks and credentials and things like that. You know, I have a, a, a job in November that wants crew names now, and I'm really struggling to get through the actual week. Um, you know, we've we've had a lot of things come up this week, and I haven't even thought about that job. I've got it laid out. It's in Lasso. I can hit a couple of buttons and maybe get an idea of what's available. But mm. um, so a long lead time is not always perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I just got an email a minute ago for a little pop up this weekend um, in a market that I know I'm not going to be able to fulfill. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm ignoring it right now. <laughs> um, but it's it's a lot of things affect that. Like there's a job that we do every year that's always very LED heavy. We have an LED crew that expects to do it every year. They, they plan on it, not only in their budget for their own life and their income, but um, being with the same crew they've always been. They all get excited about seeing each other. It's a job that they love doing. I just found out that it's extremely projection heavy this year. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I'm going to do about that. So, and you know, it's months and months away, but now I really do have to consider what am I going to do with about, you know, where am I going to put those guys that are used to doing this show for me? Because I don't want to lose them for the next year. Yeah. Um, and how many of them can I keep together and where in the heck am I going to find that many projectionists at that time of the year when I know that I'm not used to finding them? Yeah. Um, lead times are tricky. And, you know, I do love a, a getting a, a dates for a job that don't include the travel, that don't include the prep. And then when we get closer, they're like, oh, but wait, we need them for prep. Okay. That was a really important detail that I needed. And now I ask every single time yeah. because some, uh, right, especially right now, people are going from show to show to show. So if I ask someone for the 15th to the 20th, it may fit perfectly. They're come, traveling from a show on the 15th and to another one on the 20th. I can't mess that up or I'm not going to have that person. So Lead times, I don't know that I've ever seen a perfect one. <laughs> There's no such you know, thing. That's right. There is. And and even, you know, even shows that um, that 
we get, you know, they'd say, okay, we, we are anticipating this being a projection gig. Something happens with um, budgets and they say, all right, let's just do this all LED. But all the projectionists that we have held for three weeks because we had great lead time and we got great projectionists, five of them don't do LED also. So now we have no lead time. We've mm-hmm. got two weeks to figure out a, an entirely different crew. And now we have to figure out something to do with the people that we've held for all of this time, because I'm not just going to tell them no, especially in this kind of situation, you know, they're not going to pay a cancellation fee because it isn't canceled. It's just changed. But to them, it doesn't impact their budget or what they've done to us. It's a huge impact. And I can't, I'm not going to just tell my guys over oh, this, this went away or something like that when I've held them for that long, because I had a great lead time. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where the perfect lead time is, but I have seldom encountered it. Yes. I, I think that is the sentiment of, of many for sure. Aaron, what are, what are you seeing? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the lead time thing is, is not having a perfect lead time is, um, something we deal with even with crewing as well, because, you know, sometimes you can book people too far in advance and they may lose track of that, or um, they might be reluctant to book it because they're waiting for the best opportunity and they know some, you know, it's the best time of the year. Um, And uh, yeah, I think, you know, to me, what the kind of overarching thing that Susan was speaking to is fluidity. Right. And I think that especially in the post pandemic market where we're going from no events to, people wanting, making sure they spend their budgets so that they don't lose them. Because, you know, when, when you're dealing with like a corporate structure and there's something allocated for marketing or allocated for conference or experiential, um, if that doesn't get used, it, it can get removed from the bottom line for the next year. And so because things have been so fluid, even with COVID restrictions, um, there's a lot of last minute, all right, you know, let's just pull the trigger on this. We're going to, we want to use the budget. And so we have found that there's a lot more fluidity, which can create more challenges in in terms of the last minute or being properly, you know, given the tools to really execute properly. But um, in in our experience, there has also been more flexibility on the client side um, and more understanding of the need to, you know, increase an hourly rate to, to get something done or um, to, to pay a crash fee or whatever, whatever the case may be. So we, we've actually um, had a good experience with the, with, with that kind of increased fluidity that we're seeing in the industry, um, but also have chosen and need and want to be proactive about seizing that opportunity to, to be assertive and um, you know, boundaried and clear about what our needs are in terms of how we are given the tools to take care of our crew to be able to execute, you know, and I, and I think um, uh, especially coming out of the pandemic, I feel like there has been more understanding about that. And then also I think more willingness uh, on our part and everybody's part to have that transparency. I mean, even the fact, even the culturally how we've shifted to zoom meetings or, you know, zoom podcasts, as opposed to meeting in person. Um, I think there's something about the uh, humanizing of everyone through this shared um, like just traumatic experience that um, I, I personally feel like there's a little more human understanding um, in the, in the face of that fluidity at, at the moment. I love that because you I'm going to ask you both this question just a minute because I wrap up every podcast with one question, which is what do you hope for the future of our industry? So while you're thinking on how to answer that, I think what you just said is so important because if you would have asked me what I hoped for our industry two to three years ago, it would have been to make it more human and humane because there was so much skepticism. There was so much you know, just infighting and awful competition. There, there is such a thing as friendly and productive competition, right? Like, and coming together as a team for a common good to produce an amazing show. It takes teams and companies who are sometimes competing, working together at the show site. And when there's less um, infighting, backbiting, backstabbing, and more just fluidity, as you put it, it really does make for a better industry. And as an industry, we've got to figure out what to do to entice more people to join it, right? To, to build a career here. And for those of you that are listening that are newcomers to the industry and are still trying to figure it out, 
There is never a better time to join a cooler industry that is growing by leaps and bounds, that is continuing to push the limits. You know, when I'm at different show sites, I am blown away by some of the technical capabilities that we didn't even have two years ago. And it just continues to evolve and evolve and all the creatives in our industry. And it is a privilege to get to be a part of what our industry is doing. And so I am thrilled to see that our industry is becoming more fluid. They are more humane. There is more humanity in it. There's kindness, there's teamwork, there's accountability, which is one of the things each of you spoke about too, right? If someone is relying on you, if your client is relying on you, you each have a sense of accountability and commitment. You are not taking lightly the ask that is made of you. And I just love that. And I think the more people do that, the more crew realize we're counting on you to show up with a good attitude, be professional, bring your best self. So those of you that are thinking about entering this industry, if you can do those things, you are going to make a fortune and have the time of your life doing it. And so my question for each of you as we wrap up is, what do you each hope for the future of our industry? I learned something about 12 years ago that changed the way I work, especially in this job. Every job is personal to to everyone. Um, An artist has an idea that they want to express. It usually comes from a feeling that they have. And then they take it to a, a, a designer who has their own expression that they want to get out in that, their own reputation that they want to build on. It comes to us. We, everything we do is for the next job, for um, getting a new client. Every time we go to a show site, every time we do a job, when I have people that I have going out on the show site, it's personal to them. They're away from their family. They're working to support their family. It's important to them. They also have a reputation stake in everything they do while they're there. I think that if everyone thinks about the personalization of every aspect of it and treats each other that way, just like you're saying, humane and human, that makes better shows, that makes better jobs, it makes everything um, go easier as well as more productive. Enjoy that part of it. Great thoughts. What about you, Aaron? What do you hope for the future? You know, more fluidity, more collaboration and, and mutual understanding. I think, you know, what I've learned over years of business partnership in, in various areas, not just this area alone, is that um, no no two people are ever going to be 100 percent aligned. It's all about, um, you know, it, it's all a Venn diagram and we have to focus on what our shared goals are and where we can work together to achieve that goal. And I think, you know, in terms of um it's, it's all a vehicle, right? It, going back to the car metaphor, um, spark plug might be a tiny thing, but if you don't have the spark plug in the car, the entire car doesn't work. When you pay for your vehicle, that's not the end of you investing in your vehicle. If you want it to run the right way, you need to um, change your fluids. You, you, know, you need to put the right gasoline in it. And so when crews come to a job site, look at the human being as a, as a resource and as an investment. And if they don't have coffee or the right breaks um, or, you know, travel or hotel, you're actually devaluing uh, your investment the way that you would devalue your vehicle if you didn't have regular inspections and and tune-ups. My hope for the future of the industry and something that we are definitely focused on at, at Groundwork is more of that humanization, uh, more diversity in the industry as well. You know, um, because of my personal background in New York City, just being a super diverse and integrated place. And then my experience in the music industry being a a big piece of the um, social network that has allowed me to assemble a crew. We have a lot of black and brown um, people of color, diverse um, socioeconomic backgrounds on our crew. And there are a lot of areas where we run into, you know, a a historically white, blue collar, 
union um, type crewing and um, then also the perception of a crew that may look different that um, we are working actively to change and you know, we work with the parole office in New York City to provide employment for people coming home from jail. We, we in our training, have emotional skills as one of the main focuses, not just practical skills and all of these kind of like outcome oriented things, depersonalizing, um, helping people understand that code switching is actually a, a, not like fake or a, a sellout thing, but it's a, an incredible resource and in being able to communicate in multiple cultural languages to turn and deal with a client and then to turn around and, and deal with um, individuals from a different background and be able to treat everybody with respect. Um, you know, that's that's our our hope for the future and continuing to empower people for upward mobility from being um, being labor, and I'm using that deliberately now because a lot of our crew enters with no skills and we focus on elevating them. We only hire internally for our leadership and even on our administrative side, um, you know, the, the full timers that we have on our crew now who are in lasso staffing, creating quotes are people who come from sitting on a forklift and having no skills who then were given the opportunity um, to learn and, you know, I'm, I'm a parent myself and a lot of times we use baby talk when we speak to children and we're robbing them of the opportunity to, to learn adult language because we're assuming a limitation and, impl and imposing that limitation. And so we just um, teach everybody everything we can. If they retain it, then that's great. If they don't, then it's, um, you know, no energy wasted. And so, um, yeah, I think I agree with with both of you totally. The humanization, more um, cross cultural, cross uh, skill set conversations from account teams to people who are physically executing. That's my um, hope for the future, and something that we at Groundwork are certainly um, working for. And I also want to echo your statement about the value of this industry for people looking to find a trade or a profession because you know, um, no one's going to be able to automate this industry from the execution standpoint, you know, tools like lasso have made our lives much easier. They are, they are still supporting the allocation of human resources and there are not going to be robots that can replace, you know, experiential marketing or event production. So this is definitely isn't going anywhere. And it is such a, a roller coaster ride of emotions and requirements to be able to execute these events. The range of skill sets that you will pick up from, you know, whether it's, you know, how to use a drill or how to operate a forklift or how to, you know, set up and, and calibrate a projector to how to manage a team and how to deal with a client and um, how to manage your own emotions at, two in the morning in the rain after a 15 hour shift. I cannot thank you both enough just for your leadership, just for being good people. Um, seriously, you guys are both great. Your companies are great to work for. Um, our team loves working with each of your companies, but you all have such great perspectives and opinions. And it's why I asked you both to be here because you've seen a lot. Um, and you're doing good things and you're doing good things in spite of sometimes bad circumstances and you value the most important thing in all of this, which is the people. That's why we say it all the time. Every event experience is only as good as the people who make it happen. It's not the gear. It's not the trucks. It's the people. Um, and so you get that. And, and I love that our industry is really beginning to, to hone in on that. Um, so I think that's fantastic. So thank you both for joining today and for helping us unpack this. Uh, for you companies out there, be, be kind to your suppliers. Be cognizant of the position you're putting them in. Suppliers, be respectful of what you're being asked to do. Look, don't let that be lost on you. They trust you. Um, and I love, Aaron, that you said there's an accountability and a commitment and know when to say no. And I think that's really important. And Susan, you said that's one of the things you look for is the reliability and transparency. And the more honest we are with each other, the more we can do together. And so thank you both for helping us unpack this topic. For those of you who like what you hear, don't forget to subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, um, please reach out to us at podcast at lasso.io. And that is it for today. 